I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. There's no way I can't do it. No way. Why did you guys say, why did you guys come in and say you, you were searching for an assault? In the stillness of a college town, two lives collided in a way that neither could have predicted, forever altering the futures of everyone involved. George Hewley, an ambitious young man with a fiery temper and yardly love, a bright and promising young woman, found themselves entangled in a relationship that began with passion but soon spiraled into darkness. George and Yardley were once inseparable, sharing dreams and love that seemed unbreakable. But beneath the surface lay a turbulent sea of emotions driven by jealousy, anger, and a dangerous dependency on alcohol. A toxic mix that would ultimately lead to a night of violence, confusion, and tragedy. But what happened on that fateful night? How did a young love turn into a nightmare? And what can we learn from the tragic events that unfolded? Join me as we uncover the shocking details of this heart-wrenching story and explore the twists and turns that led to a conclusion no one saw coming. George Hewley and Yardley Love met while studying at the same college. Two talented students with promising futures, they quickly fell in love and became a well-known couple around campus. George was a lacrosse player, athletic and full of energy, while Yardley was admired for her intelligence, beauty, and grace. But as time went on, cracks began to appear in this picture-perfect relationship. Their friends and family began to notice alarming signs. George's excessive drinking was leading to uncontrollable anger and aggression, especially when it came to Yardley. Arguments escalated, jealous accusations flew, and the very love that once bound them together began to turn into something dark and destructive. The relationship reached a breaking point when Yardley discovered George's violent tendencies and alcohol issues. She made the painful decision to break up with him, hoping to escape the cycle of toxicity that had engulfed them both. But George, desperate and enraged by what he perceived as betrayal, couldn't let go. The breakup only fueled his anger and obsession. In the days following their separation, George's behavior became more erratic and alarming. He bombarded Yardley with messages, oscillating between anger and desperation. Yardley's attempts to move on were met with George's resistance and fury. The stage was set for a tragic confrontation. George's jealousy, his refusal to accept the end of the relationship, and his anger at Yardley's perceived infidelity after the breakup created a volatile mix that would explode in a way no one could have anticipated. Little did anyone know that these were not just the signs of a broken heart. They were the precursor to a horrifying act that would leave one life shattered and another ended forever. The night of the crime began like any other. But as darkness fell, it would soon take a turn that would forever alter the lives of George and Yardley. Obsessed with confronting Yardley about her perceived infidelity and driven by a desire to have the final word, George decided to visit her apartment. Upon arriving at Yardley's place, George found the front door locked. His anger took over, leading him to punch a hole through the door to gain entry. Once inside, he headed straight to Yardley's bedroom, where the situation quickly escalated. How'd you get through the door? Her door? Mm -hmm. front door. Her door. Actually, it might have been locked. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Just, just the honest Yeah, no, yeah, it was, it was actually, it was locked, yeah. Because yeah. I think I put a hole. Yeah, you punched door. a hole through the door. Pretty sure, actually, now. Yeah. Yardley's reaction to George's sudden and uninvited appearance was one of sheer terror. She backed into a corner defensively and aggressively, shouting at George to leave. But George's version of events would change multiple times as he later tried to explain the incident. First, he claimed that Yardley was hitting the wall and that she was freaking out, and finally that she was slamming her own head against the wall in fear of him. She went to Carolina and hooked up with someone Sunday when we were still trying to figure out things. And I was over there like, like to talk, like, I was like, this is like, this is outrageous. Because I was trying to make everything better. As he went over his story about their interaction again, he changed his story. Now he was holding Yardley when- The altercation that followed was both chaotic and fatal. George, attempting to control Yardley's hysteria as he described it, grabbed her, wrestled with her, even admitted to holding her by the neck. Yardley's pleas for him to leave went unheeded. And she started being like, like freaking out. And I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything. I'm here to talk to you about everything that's ensued in the past week. And, and she was like, and like, sort of like, being like, no, 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 like, like hitting her head, like, st like, stop, like, like, she's in the corner, I was on the bed, I was like, stop, like. In the struggle, her head hit the wall repeatedly, leading to severe trauma. 
In the confusion and violence of those moments, Yardley's life was tragically cut short. George's actions in the immediate aftermath were equally troubling. He took Yardley's laptop from her room, intending to use it as collateral to force further contact with her. His confusion, rage, and obsession overpowered any sense of compassion or responsibility for what had just occurred. Leaving Yardley's lifeless body behind, he departed from the scene, unaware or perhaps in denial of the full gravity of what he had done. The ticking clock, a shadowy room, and the echoes of a fatal struggle were now the only witnesses to a crime that would soon send shockwaves through the community and reveal the dark underbelly of a relationship that once seemed full of promise. Detective Lisa, a seasoned investigator, was assigned to the case and recognized the importance of a careful approach to the interrogation. Her strategy was methodical and precise, starting with open-ended questions, allowing George to share his version of the night without interruption. Tell him about your day yesterday. Played golf with um, our parents. It was a, a, a father son. Uh, good event. I mean, where was that at? At um, Wintergreen. Wintergreen. Mm -hmm. Okay. I went to dinner with my dad and my two buddies. Where was that? We don't care. Going to see you now. Okay. Um, and then. Uh, Went home, went to the bar for like a little while. And right, what time did you go out to eat? The golf event had to ended at five ish, so we were probably back at that was probably seven thirty with dinner. George's initial responses were fraught with emotion. His language peppered with the word "like" as he stammered through his account, betraying his anxiety. First, when like. Had, um, I went to the bar for a little while, I went to Boyle, Boyle Heights. Oh, okay. Um, then I went over to talk to Yardley. And Who's went, Yardley? Yardley what, is my former girlfriend. Okay. Which this whole thing's about, which I understand. But when I went over to talk to Yardley, I, I like was like, Yardley. And she was like, already like totally freaked out because of what she did this past like a few days ago and she we haven't talked since and I was just gonna go talk to her mm -hmm. and she was already like oh like freaking out like you know you can't go make a camera and I was like I'm like just trying to talk to you and like she like started being like like getting like all like you know, like really like defensive against it because the week before she came into my apartment and like attacked, like and started striking me. And I like, was like, all right, you gotta leave. And like had my roommate's girlfriend. As the interrogation continued, inconsistencies in George's story began to emerge. His description of Yardley's reaction changed repeatedly. His narrative of how he entered the apartment shifted. With skillful questioning, Lisa began to corner George, forcing him to admit details he'd initially avoided. Of this, so when I when I went in to talk to her, because literally she had been away, we had been away. When I talked to her, she was already like on the defensive edge, and like I was like, "Listen, I'm not here. To, like, I'm just here to talk to you." And she like got all like like sat up, like, her bed's against the wall, like if it was in this corner, she was like up against the wall and I was like, like we were sitting there talking and like she started being like, like, you know, like getting like all like aggressive after this. And so I was like, all right, like chill out, like and shook her a little bit. And she started being like, like freaking out. And I was like, listen, I'm not like here to do anything. I'm here to talk to you about everything that's ensued in the past week and and she was like and like sort of like being like no 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 like, like hitting her head like st like stop like like she's in the corner i was sitting on the bed i was like stop like i was like we were like what the hell like we were just going to talk and like it was not at all like a good conversation because that's like she was already like freaking out with just even seeing me just even seeing me there. George's claims of holding Yardley's arms, being persistent, and wrestling her to the floor began to paint a picture far more incriminating than the image of a concerned ex-boyfriend he had first presented. What happened next? 
But I would nag and she was, just kept hitting her head against the, against the wall while she was sitting on the bed. And I was like, and I grabbed her and I like shook her. I was like, stop, like we need to like, and looked at her. I was like, we need to like talk about this. And like, I mean, I was all holding her arm and stuff, but like I'm, I never struck her. I never like hit her, hit her like in the face or anything. I was just like, we need to talk. And she was so like, she was so like, oh, I knew what's the word. Like, you know, like, like flop, a fish out of the water, like, like, so like, all this, all because of what happened last week. And I was like, listen, like, I'm not here to like fight with you or like do anything, like, I'm here to talk to you. Lisa's experience in interrogations was evident as she artfully applied emotional pressure, leading George to open up about his jealousy and rage over Yardley's post-breakup actions. He finally revealed that he had punched a hole through the door to get to her and even admitted to grabbing Yardley's neck. What about choking Yardley? I may have grabbed her a little bit by the neck mm -hmm. when we were like, but I never like strangled her. Okay. Um, okay. But I, yeah, I mean, during the whole like commotion, you know, like, I, we may have, I might have grabbed her neck, but I never was, never was like strangling her. Mm -hmm. His contradictory statements were now woven into a tapestry of guilt, his initial bravado unraveling. I wish she's not dead though, please. Can you tell me she's not dead? Relax. Please. We Collection of evidence was equally vital. George's phone containing the text messages to Yardley was taken and preserved along with the examination of his fresh injuries, further contradicting his claims. They were, they were like, I guess what you call like a like an like ongoing conversation, an ongoing like it's a message and it's gone. See how Lisa grabbed his phone and put it to the side? Now it was evidence. Lisa's partner, Ed, joined the conversation, probing George's motives and amplifying the scrutiny. That's a breakup, exactly. Why? Why? Yeah. Well, we are not, we are not from the same area. Right. And I'm going, or she wants to move to New York and I'm not exactly sure what, what I'm doing yet, but I'm the Closing the interrogation, Lisa moved towards the final questions targeting George's emotional state and pushing him to realize the gravity of his actions. She's dead. She's dead. The room's tension reached a peak as the walls closed in on George, his defenses shattered, his story exposed. I tried to fight with you, you punched her in the head, or you cracked her head. You cracked her head. You cracked her head in the window or in the in the wall. She is. She's not. I ain't BSing you right now. It's serious. The interrogation was a masterclass in precision and empathy, drawing out the truth from a complex and emotional situation. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have to leave. I was like a little bit persistent. I mean, she's screaming. She should have been. This is a depth handling of the questioning laid bare the tragic events of the night and set the stage for the legal battle to come. The echoes of George's faltering voice lingered long after he was led away, a haunting reminder of the terrible reality of that night and the broken lives left in its wake. The case against George wasn't merely constructed on his inconsistent statements. It was substantiated with a mosaic of evidence that went beyond the confines of the interrogation room. Physical evidence played a vital role. George's own body bore the marks of the violence with fresh bruises and injuries that contradicted his claims of playing lacrosse. The signs of a break-in at Yardley's apartment told their own story, the punched hole through the door, the disarray of the room, all were silent witnesses to George's violent intrusion. Yardley's injuries, most notably the fatal head trauma, were consistent with an intense struggle and were not aligned with George's assertions of her causing them herself in a state of distress. Emotional evidence also painted a vivid picture. George's anger and jealousy were evident in his erratic behavior during the interrogation, his palpable desperation to explain his actions, his shifting narratives all unmasking the underlying fury that had driven him to Yardley's apartment that night. Yardley's fear and distress could be discerned through her reactions as described by George, the unmistakable terror of a young woman trapped in a nightmarish scenario, her pleas for George to leave, her frantic attempts to defend herself. Technology-based evidence further sealed George's fate. The text messages he had sent to Yardley, now secure from his phone, were a digital trail leading to his guilt, a chronicle of his anger and his unraveling relationship. Other communications, digital footprints, added layers of context, building an unbreakable chain that linked George to the crime. The evidence methodically collected and analyzed formed an irrefutable argument against George. It spoke not just of a single night's tragic incident, but of a pattern of toxic behavior and unchecked aggression. 
They told a story that went beyond George and Yardley, a story that resonated with a universal cry against domestic violence and the shadows it casts on lives. The legal battle that followed was fraught with emotion, expectation, and the relentless scrutiny of the public eye. Inside the courtroom, testimonies were heard, memories revisited, and evidence presented, all under the watchful gaze of a nation captivated by a story that was as tragic as it was enigmatic. Witnesses took the stand, each adding a piece to the puzzle, unraveling the events of that fateful night and the complex relationship between George and Yardley. The prosecution meticulously laid out the evidence, from the physical marks of violence to the damning text messages, building a case that was as unyielding as it was compelling. The defense, however, fought back, painting a picture of a troubled young man driven to the brink, arguing that his actions, though indefensible, were not premeditated. They pleaded for understanding, for mercy, for a recognition of George's humanity, even in his darkest hour. The verdict, when it came, was a moment suspended in time. The judge's ruling resonated with the weight of justice and the sorrow of a life lost too soon. The court considered George's age, his lack of criminal history, and his apparent remorse, balancing them against the gravity of his crime. A sentence was pronounced and a courtroom held its collective breath, a mix of relief and anguish in the eyes of Yardley's family, devastation in the faces of George's loved ones. Reactions from both families echoed the complexity of the case. Yardley's family, though relieved at the verdict, would forever be marked by a loss that no judgment could heal. George's family, on the other hand, struggled with a sentence they saw as too harsh for what they believed was a tragic mistake. I, I believed our criminal justice system works, and it, the criminal justice system gets it right, but it doesn't always get it right. He had absolutely no intent to hurt Yardley. Yardley was his best friend. The media portrayed the trial with an intensity that mirrored the public's fascination, dissecting every detail, every word, every emotion. Today in George Hughley's murder trial, on Tuesday, doctors gave graphic testimony of how his ex-girlfriend, fellow University of Virginia student Yardley Love, died two years ago. Commentators debated the fairness of the verdict, the role of toxic relationships and alcohol abuse, and the societal implications of the case. Community reactions were divided with some seeing justice served, others questioning if enough had been done to address the underlying issues that led to such a horrific outcome. In the end, the trial and verdict became more than a legal process. They became a reflection of a society grappling with questions about love, anger, responsibility, and the delicate balance between justice and compassion. The tale of George and Yardley, marred by violence, jealousy, and loss, leaves behind a wake of devastation, reaching far beyond the two young lives at its center. The impact on both families is profound and enduring. Yardley's family must grapple with a void that can never be filled, their lives forever altered by a tragedy that continues to echo in the hearts of those who loved him. George's family, meanwhile, must come to terms with the fact that a child they raised is responsible for an act of shocking violence, facing not only legal consequences, but the relentless judgment of society. George's future after prison is a complex one. While his sentence may eventually end, the scars of what transpired will likely never fade. You must navigate a world that has seen him at his very worst, rebuilding his life in the shadow of his actions. It's a journey fraught with challenges, but one that could also provide a chance for redemption, growth, and understanding. The wider implications of the incident reach even further, casting a spotlight on the dangers of domestic violence and the importance of recognizing signs before they escalate into tragedy. It's a stark reminder that toxic relationships can have lethal consequences, and that society must take action to educate, support, and intervene. It's a call to each one of us to be vigilant, compassionate, and proactive, not only in our personal relationships, but in our communities as well. But perhaps the most poignant lesson lies in the complexity of human emotions and the fine line between love and hatred, compassion, and cruelty. It's a reminder that each one of us carries within us the capacity for both good and bad, and that our choices, however small, can lead us down paths we never anticipated. In closing, the story of George and Yardley is more than a cautionary tale. It's a reflection of our collective humanity. It challenges us to look deeper, to question our assumptions, to strive for empathy, and to learn from our mistakes. It's a story that resonates with timeless themes echoing the fragility of life and the importance of love, understanding, and forgiveness. And perhaps most of all, it's a story that reminds us that we must never become complacent in our efforts to create a world where such tragedies are a thing of the past, where relationships are nurtured with respect and kindness, and where each individual is seen, heard, and valued for who they truly are. As the screen fades to black and the echoes of this profound story linger in our minds, I want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for watching. Your time and attention mean more than words can express, and I hope that this journey has been as thought-provoking and impactful for you as it has been for me in presenting it. If this story resonated with you, or if you have thoughts, questions, or reflections you'd like to share, I invite you to engage in the comments section below. 
Your perspectives and voices are what fuel this community, and your likes and subscribes help ensure that these important stories continue to reach a wider audience. I must also extend heartfelt gratitude to the many researchers, collaborators, and experts who contributed to this project. Their tireless efforts, insights, and dedication were instrumental in bringing accuracy and depth to the narrative. And to those directly affected by the events depicted, my deepest respect and sympathy go out to you. And now, as we part ways, I leave you the final thought. May we all strive to live with empathy, awareness, and courage, building a world that reflects the very best of who we can be. Thank you once again for joining me. Until next time, take care and be well.